Hello, I'm John Schaefers with Signal Magazine, and I welcome you to the Signal webinar series. Today's webinar is with ServiceNow, and it is entitled Simplify Innovation and Readiness for the Warfighter. During the webinar, which will take about an hour, Alex Beachy, Sheila O'Donnell, and Lisa Getz will discuss simple modernization methods to help warfighters save time and improve operational readiness and effectiveness. Let me introduce you to our guests. Alex Kronk Beachy is a former Marine helicopter pilot and acquisition professional with a propensity to fly low and talk loud. At ServiceNow, he helps lead Navy organizations through their digital transformations. Through experience, Sheila O'Donnell understands that large technology transformations often leave employees struggling with how to navigate internal systems. At ServiceNow, she evangelizes about leveraging HR workflow to enhance employee satisfaction. And Lisa Getz has spent more than 30 years providing HR solutions for state, local, and federal government organizations, including the Defense Department. Her focus at ServiceNow is on simplifying business processes to improve employees' lives. Throughout this webinar, attendees are welcome to submit questions electronically through the Ask a Question box on the webinar console. When our experts are finished presenting, we will have a Q&A for as long as time allows or until we run out of questions. And with that, I think we're ready to begin. Alex, uh, why don't you get us started? All right. Thank you, George. Thanks for that great introduction. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Alex Beachy, I'm the Enterprise Account Executive for the Navy, one of, the, uh, one of many great teammates uh, at, on ServiceNow's Navy Marine Corps team. And as the name implies, simplify innovation and readiness for the warfighter. And I think a lot of times people go, that's great, Alex. Sounds like, sounds like a pipe dream, you know, how do you simplify innovation? Because constantly, you know, it's something that is, is at, the top is, at the top levels of decision making. And that's really where I'm trying to change the paradigm shift a little bit. And so what we have to do is reposition what the concept of innovation can be and is all about. Because largely we think of it from a very expensive dollar budget, uh, you know, a billion dollar budget kind of system. Like, aircraft carriers and the F-35 um, Joint Strike Fighter. It's, it's these big programs, a lot of money, a lot of time invested into it, research and development, and, and it's very few people control the budget for all of that. And these are great solutions. They're, they're modernizing the way in which we can do war fighting. But where do most of the, the innovative processes and, and the policies and everything else really lie is in shaping how we help the warfighter. And, and I look at strictly the policies and the processes associated with the back end work that they do. Um, there's a lot of time and energy spent in things that don't make them combat ready. You know, I just, as a, as an aviator, there was, there's countless times where I'm doing mundane tasks that have nothing to do with me flying the aircraft. And that ultimately boils down to a readiness issue. If we can free up the time for them to focus on combat training, then we're improving the readiness of the entire Navy. So, and this is for every, every command has the ability to innovate at that level, right? We give it to the commanders to make these decisions and move forward in new and drastic ways. So, we're going to look at that a little bit today, and this isn't a new or novel concept. I mean, the, the CNO on down is talking about it. I was at the Surface Navy Association Symposium back in January, and this is talked about throughout the Navy and the Marine Corps. We're working together uh, to build out a better readiness capability, looking to, you know, the Pacific and, and aligning things to cross the Navy and the Marine Corps more fluidly, but that also involves breaking down some of the silos of operations streamlining business processes so that the warfighter can get back to training for the mission. So today, the way we've uh, ServiceNow has structured naval readiness and the way we're supporting naval readiness is in six pillars. We do a lot of different work, but we were, we're focusing in different areas of these six pillars of naval readiness. They're all transformational. They all align with business back-end business processes. 
and and there's different organizations that could leverage these in, in great and new and interesting ways. But today, we're going to talk about that last one, the personnel readiness, and strictly the precision onboarding, because this is a problem that, that resides throughout every command in every part of the world. And, and it's, not, it's not new or unique to anybody. We've just so become so ingrained with the way we've always done it that it's sometimes hard for us to think about the value we can get out of simplifying that process. And so I'm gonna take you on a quick journey and it's, it's my own journey. So I was, uh, I was in the Marines for 15 years, active duty. And in those 15 years, I was, with, I was at nine different duty stations and with 15 different commands. So on average, I was moving from command to command once a year, which meant new check-in processes, new, new policies that I had to go through. Um, and it all officially started with, you know, that manual orders process. Now things have become a little bit more modern in this, in this realm, but it's still a stove type solution. But back then, you know, it was hand jamming away on Microsoft Word to figure out, you know, type everything in perfect um, naval correspondence manual process and make sure everything was dotted, I's were dotted and T's were crossed, but it was a manually intensive process and it didn't communicate outside. And I had to wait for that before I could kick off the next process. So part of the process. So it was a manually intensive orders assignment process. And then it went into the move. So I finally got my orders. Congratulations, Alex, you're, you're moving from North Carolina out to uh, California. So pack up everything and go and back in the day now we've got move.mil again a little bit more digital but still a, still a, a, a cylinder of excellence doesn't streamline the whole business process of getting a marine or a sailor from one location to the next and once i finally got there i had to fill out my voucher and i had to plug in all the information and if i moved independently of my spouse or my kids i had to fill out other forms and it's just a it's a form filling nightmare and a lot of the information already exists on the manual orders process I just can't carry it over. I have to do it all manually and hand write it out. And it's gotten a little bit better, but it's still not where it could be. But the real heartache of all of this lies in the, I'm waiting for this slide to catch up to me, is in the check-in process. And this is really where we're focusing today. So the orders assignment, the move process, there's, there are digitization methods happening right now, but once, once a sailor or Marine or a civilian or a contractor's feet hit the deck is when the check-in process typically starts. So that means somebody has created an Excel spreadsheet, they've printed it out, they hand it to somebody, they hand it to the new employee, new Marine, new sailor and say, congratulations, welcome to the command. Now go walk around and find these people and get signatures. And we become so ingrained with this as a process that we now, we now justify it in, in a whole new ways. So we'd we be like, well, it's really important for them to have face-to-face -face with these people. I was the family readiness officer for my last command for like two years. And every single Marine sailor that uh, came aboard the command had to see me and I had to sign off. I did have my own backend processes, but it was still, I had to email them forms, they printed them out or they digitally signed them and filled them out and sent them back to me. I kept my own repository, and but they still had to come and get my physical signature, even with all the emailing back and forth. And there was no oversight into that. Nobody knew if I was getting it done. It was, it was relying upon me. And so what ends up happening is people walk around and yeah, they see my face, but 99% of the Marines and sailors never had to meet with me again. So that it's a really, it's, I just, I, don't believe in the validity of having to walk around and meet everybody face to face with all these back end processes because most of the time it's not necessary. And so where we where and then in top of all of this, the forms change. The people who are doing those duties, uh, duties, those collateral duties, they change. So now you have a stale form. You've got people walking around trying to chase people down when they finally find them. They're on leave for a week and a half. And so now they got to wait for that process. And then lo and behold, Somebody needs another type of access to a different network. And now we've got to kick off that whole process independently in a stovepipe manner. And the time spent in all of this is wasted. It's wasted for the new employee, the new Marine, new sailor, 
Um, it's wasted on the people who have to do those back end processes. Cause like the fro family readiness officer, I really didn't have to do that. I, I could have automated it. It wasn't like I did anything unique and really valuable from a form filling process. And there's a lot of time spent that isn't necessary. And that's where we can save a lot of time and energy. But this is a problem that's solved at the command specific level. Every command has a, their own ways of checking people in. Even subordinate commands have their own policies and processes for checking people in. And it's a lot of time and the energy spent and wasted. And so really what I want you to come away from with all of this is that time is readiness in waiting. The idea that we can free up the sailors and the Marines, the civilians, the contractors who support our mission and have them focus on mission specific criteria, not all the administrative stuff to get them operational, not all the op administrative stuff to have them leave the command or retire. Those are all things that can be automated and streamlined so that we're saving them time and energy to focus on training, to get them ready for the next fight. So with that being said, I'm going to introduce to you Ms. Sheila O'Donnell. I'll call her our Warfighter Experience Solution Specialist. Um, she's going to walk you through the value that ServiceNow plays in this bigger picture. So, Sheila, off to you. All right. Thank you, Alex. And thank you for sharing your journey. Um, great story. And uh, so what I'm going to talk about today is expanding upon this idea of onboarding, but also uh, what it means from a um, improving the efficiencies uh, for employee experience del uh, delivery. And the reason why this is so important is as you look at the most, the highest levels within the Department of Navy, they are focused on improving um, and making the employee experience uh, more efficient and better. And that's not just tied to the Navy. This is across the Department of Defense, uh, across system integrators, and even within commercial industry. The challenge that we face though is that less than half of the people, uh, employees out there believe that their employer is improving or investing in their experience. And that's a huge disconnect. And I think one of the biggest reasons why that disconnect is there is because today when someone leaves their office and they want to go ahead and, uh, you know, order food, they can go to Uber Eats, they get the immediately, very easy to download the app. Or if they want to order something from Amazon, um, it's very simple, one or two clicks of a button and the product or service is there within, you know, a couple of days at the most. This is not true of employee experiences at work. And this is as going back to what Alex just mentioned, the readiness and what that means to the overall experience for the warfighter and those are supporting the effort. And the onboarding landscape is probably the most important and where a lot of people like to focus because it's the first entry and there, the onboarding sets the tone for the rest of the journey within the Navy. And with, with only 12% feeling that their organization is great at onboarding, we have a long way to go. So the employee journey is a warfighter journey could be either three years or 35 years. And along the way, there's a lot of pivotal moments. You know, we talked about a change of station. Um, and now these days, um, after leaving work because of the pandemic, coming back to work. Um, these are just a couple of things and having a child. And along the way, there's also many micro moments um, that that pe that people are focused on. And um, as Alex really uh, described just now, that these experiences along the way can also be uh, can be frustrating, uh, repetitive, and um, not focused on the mission and difficult to 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 do. And so this is why, as as we look uh, forward and trying to improve their journey and so that they can prove their focus on the mission and doing their job in readiness. So today, when an employee or a warfighter has a question, their question goes to uh, multiple organizations within the Navy. And within these organizations or departments, they have probably many different systems that support um, 
there, th th these questions being answered. And so, as you can imagine, and, and as Alex mentioned, it's repetitive. They may have to fill out their form multiple times. Uh, they have to, you know, like physically print out a worksheet and carry it and walk around and talk to people or send emails to follow up. And they're not getting the visibility that they want um, into their uh, into the questions. And so they are not sure where it sits. So as you can imagine, just not knowing and the lack of control can be stressful. And if you think about it, you know, the mission of the Navy is to maintain, train, and equip um, equip combat-ready naval forces. It's not to be searching for these basic questions to get their job done. And um, and so that's what, you know, we're focusing on. How does ServiceNow solve for this? Well, first, Slides moving pretty slowly, pardon me. Um, first, um, you know, ServiceNow at the most basic level is a system of record, a system, a system of action. And in the system of action, it can integrate with m multiple, as many systems that are other systems of record that are out there. And this is where the t tasks, the questions uh, can be answered, and this dig and will digitize the workflow so that the answers to the questions that are being asked can be done quickly and easily in a modernized, easily to use environment. And so Lisa today is gonna to show you how this is done. Um, but an example of how this works in real world, you know, I, I know this is a Navy briefing, but I do have to share with you what um, the, the Department of the Army is doing their um, civilian human resources. They started with a simple digitized, wanted to simply digitize their SAR form. And they realized the power of the solution and after uh, working with ServiceNow, they were able to, uh, they have almost 200 services running through this platform so that they can answer all sorts of questions, like the ones that you see here and many more. So what this really means is we're pivoting and shifting the, the uh, approach to how we deliver information to be more of a warfighter employee uh, focused uh, delivery approach. And what this means is, is being able to engage with the warfighter um, in a, and with a portal that can serve up information, guide them through specific requirements or needs that they need to do, and give them an ability to uh, work th through this um, engagement layer so that their requests can go to any number of departments. They don't need to know if it's going to IT, HR, facilities, or operations that their requests can go through and they are, can be answered without not having to know. And same on the other side, and delivering that information from the fulfiller side makes it so much easier um, because they have standardized uh, responses that they can send to the, uh, those warfighters. They can put the information out there so the question never even hits them so that they can focus on the more complex and challenging and not worry about the mundane questions that they are asked every single day. So the idea of onboarding um, has changed dramatically in the last 10 weeks. And we are focusing primarily our conversations today on onboarding. But the reality is, you know, we have a new environment that we're working in. Nine, 10 weeks ago, only 9% of the workforce worked from home. And now we have 42%. And many of uh, the HR directors and uh, people in operations are still reeling from how are we going to best uh, manage those who are working from home in an environment that they never had to before. And conversely, you know, how do we bring them back? Because we are starting to look at how do we bring these employees back to work, whether they were furloughed, which is not really, or whether they're furloughed or whether they just left uh, to work from home. They've always been working, but they coming back is going to be different. So engaging with the employees is extremely important. Um, understanding what their where their head is at. Um, are they do they feel safe and comfortable coming back to work? Uh, what what equipment did they need? Um, or what equipment did they use that they when they do upon the returning are they going to have to return back? So then automating those steps for return, and then. Of course, making sure that their environment is safe, that they can survey their employees, uh, the warfighters, they can understand um, if there's any health concerns, and then making sure that their workspace 
is uh, in a complete environment uh, where they can, can be safe from their uh, maybe socially distancing or have an office or things like that. So these are all new considerations that we didn't have to think about, but this platform that we're going to show you today can expand um, and to and be able to address through these uh, experience packs to address these new challenges that you all may face. So with that, I'm going to turn it to Lisa Getz. She's going to share, show you and go into a little bit more detail about what Alex and I have already talked about. Thank you, Sheila. And I'm just going to go ahead and transition over to my machine so I can give you some live interactive demo on the software and introduce you all to ServiceNow. Thank you for your time today. My name is Lisa Getz, and I'd like to walk you through how our ServiceNow onboarding can help your teams with operational and personnel readiness and making the most of these micro moments. I like that word because that really sums up a lot of these tasks that a new hire, and not only the new hire, but all of the people around uh, the new hire who have to monitor these processes, who need to sign these forms and give their approval uh, inside and outside of your organization. And when we think about onboarding, keep in mind, uh, think, step back and think of how complex that process is for an organization. And for the new hire, it's, it could be scary and confusing. They're just trying to get used to this new environment, and then they have all these new procedures that could touch all of these different systems at the same time. But it, it's including capturing information from the employee. It's getting forms completed by the, by the uh, employee. And as Sheila and Alex described, this, in order to complete this successfully, you need to make sure it successfully gets through all of these solutions and personnel in and outside of your organization. And this is a perfect case on how ServiceNow and this service platform can handle a situation with multiple solutions uh, and a work task flow that needs to be tracked. And keep in mind, we're talking about systems like HR. That is, of course, the, an obvious one to be part of onboarding. But also, it's for, for procurement and facilities and asset tracking and finance and payroll and even external systems for things like background checks and employee validation. So how can we make this less confusing for the new hire? So some ideas are, you know, first welcome them and socialize them before they start on day one. And why do we need to do this on day one? Why not before day one so that when they show up and they put their feet on the, feet on the first step, they can start getting acclimated already with insights on their new team and their command sponsor, and they can be making sure that they're getting the tools they need to do to get ready to go on day one. And also keep in mind that onboarding is the first impression that new employee has with your organization. So making sure that they have a seamless experience through these micro moments gives them more confidence that they're going to be able to, to be successful in your organization. And then they can grow and get what they need uh, as they progress through. And we also, again, want to focus on making sure that, uh, that this onboarding process gets you set up quickly for the two pillars that Alex was describing of operational readiness and personnel readiness. And we could be doing this all in this consumer-grade application that, that users are expecting these days. They expect to be able to quickly search for what they need. They expect to use t technologies like chatbots and mobile applications, and we're able to provide all of that. So in order to show you the whole path in an onboarding uh, scenario, uh, there's more than just the new hire involved, although I will be introducing you to Janelle, who is our new hire in this example, but also perhaps her command sponsor or manager. Uh, that will be Maria. So I'll show you a little bit of what she can do to make sure that the process is going along smoothly for the new hire. We also have overall back office type of, of personnel who are taking make, or making sure that the processes themselves are being completed, that they can have high visibility on not only onboarding, but also other processes for caseworkers that might need to be working on, on, those, on those particular processes. And they can also load balance to make sure that their team is able to complete things within certain service level agreements. 
We also have high-level, C-level managers who want to make sure that they have the data they need to make strategic decisions. Are things being completed on time? Are there any bottlenecks that are, that are happening? Does the process itself need to be tweaked? Do they might not even have uh, all the information they need for the process? How's the feedback from the new hires? Are things working? So being able to get that information so that they can strategically make decisions uh, and, 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 uh, and pivot as needed. Okay, so let's go ahead and go into the software, and I'd like to introduce you to Janelle's uh, experience. So what you're seeing right now is actually the employee self-service portal, uh, the, or the employee service center, for not only new hires, but all users. Uh, and it's going to be able to be configured and branded, of course, to what, whatever you need. Uh, but keep in mind, it's going to have some, some major areas that are useful for all users. So at the very top on the upper right-hand corner, you're seeing the to-do list. So as Janelle, uh, in our example, has already accepted the offer, she's in a pre-boarding stage right now. So we could start collecting information about this new hire even before day one. And as I click on the to-do list in the upper right-hand corner of your screen, it's going to take me into the different types of configurable tasks that Janelle can do. And they might include things like capturing information, as you can see on the complete the new hire profile on the right-hand side. She might be able to upload a profile fo uh, photo, but also she might be able to sign certain types of forms. So we can load your, your, uh, your forms directly into the, uh, into the application and even be able to capture uh, digital signatures uh, that could be, uh, that could be uh, signed uh, directly onto the form itself. So keep in mind, the different stages and tasks can be pushed to the particular user just based on who they are and the type of job that they have. As I scroll down, you can also start seeing these panels in the middle, your orientation, your recipe for success, DIBS brown bag. These are just examples of what we call uh, curated, uh, scheduled content that could be pushed to the type of role that this person is going to be representing. This can also be links to training, and they're smart as well. So as these tasks are completed, maybe they've completed their orientation, maybe they've taken a course, they will drop off and be able to be replaced by something new that's useful for this, for this particular user. So these are all uh, ways of pushing information of policies uh, as well to the, uh, to the new hire uh, as, they're, as they're getting used to the organization. You're also seeing that we can also support mu multimedia. So we can also push out videos, allow them to have quick access to things like reporting, uh, reporting issues that they might need to. As we're socializing this new hire, we can introduce them to their team on the left-hand corner and also allow them to collaborate with other users. So they might be able to chat or uh, ask questions to other people who are going through the same process. Uh, they also might be able to uh, take care and leverage other types of uh, knowledge articles that are appropriate for where they are in the organization. And again, they can also have uh, access to something that we're calling the ServiceNow chatbot, which is delivered with 15 services out of the box, and you can configure them better uh, so, so that they match your policies. And this is where we can have automated decision trees that can collect information, they can log tickets, uh, they can um, also d guide somebody to uh, a certain amount or, or certain knowledge articles that might be appropriate as well. So in this case, she might just want to add an emergency contact. So it's going to prompt this user for information. So I can start adding my emergency contact uh, and take, take this through um, and collect information directly from the chat bot. So lots of ways of interacting with the system according to uh, what, uh, what that, uh, that, that particular scenario is. Uh, and also, if I need to start uh, really talking to a live agent, uh, I can also do it directly from this uh, chatbot as well. So just a little bit of a taste of what first the Employee Service Center looks like, um, also some of the capabilities from an onboarding perspective according to your personalized tasks for that person, for that job, 
a little bit about the scheduled campaign content, which is, are these squares in the middle, or these windows in the middle that are also going to be smart enough to push out the right information for the person. We can even get down to the location level. So a per person who is scheduled to be in a particular city or in a particular building might get different content than somebody in a different location. So going back to, uh, to our, little, uh, our little new hire experience, you were introduced to the new hire center, the employee service center, some of the tools that could, that could be helping the new hire get uh, launched right on day one. But also I want to make sure that you are also aware that this is also uh, available in a mobile experience through the ServiceNow mobile app. We can push out uh, things like emails and log on credentials for the new hire. And they can do all of that type of, uh, of, of onboarding tasks also directly from the mobile device. Uh, also keep in mind, just we have also examples in, in addition to, uh, to the knowledge articles, but also they can select their equipment. They can select their, their, uh, their software or their other types of equipment directly through our tool set so that they have all of the items that they need uh, as well. So moving on to the next role in our experience, now that you've seen that employee experience, um, we're also going to start showing you uh, the Janelle's manager, so or, or her our command sponsor, uh, who is uh, named Maria. And Maria is representing uh, being able to see uh, how that process is going uh, so far for her for her user to make sure that uh, she's getting everything done on time. So now I'm shifting roles. If you can see in the upper right hand corner, it is a different person. Uh, I'm going to go into her to do list. And her to-do list is uh, focused really on making sure that she can monitor this onboarding uh, process. She might be a new manager, so we can also push out different policies, different documents that are related to being a manager and helping somebody through the onboarding process. But also she can see some of the major tasks that she needs to take care of. And of course, this would be configured to your tasks, but they can include anything, uh, even things like making sure security has been set up properly for this new hire. And when we're talking about, and really this is harkening back to Alex's check-in type of process that he was describing, we can start really looking at the whole picture for, for those authorized users who can see all of the uh, processes that are involved. And we can break them down into stages as you're seeing on the timeline on the left. But I can also see all of the personnel who are included in this onboarding process in our sample, and who is going to be owning these processes as they, uh, as they progress. Again, we can see these forms that need to be filled out. We can see security-related tasks, asset tracking tasks, uh, even things that happen outside of, uh, of the organization like drug screenings. And all of these things are going to be helping to streamline those micro moments for those users. So that's a little bit about Maria's uh, experience. And again, uh, take a look back at how we can automate that checking process, be able to see and monitor and audit what's going on with, uh, with all the tasks when they were done, and even see what their due dates are. The next role I wanted to show you is somebody who's going to be working in the back office who is going to be managing all of the processes themselves and to be able to have visibility on what's going on with those processes. And that person is my, uh, my caseworker, Harry Taylor, as you can see in the upper right-hand corner. And I know there's a lot going on this screen, so let me kind of break it down for you. At the very top, we can see a list of all of the different case agents who might be working or, or available to work on different tasks that are coming in. Some might be onboarding, some might be other related tasks coming in. At the very top of each one of these columns is the, uh, the, the caseworker who is responsible for the tasks below. And from here we can also, if we ever need to load balance, um, I can drag and drop different tasks from one person to another, provided that they have the authorization and skills to be able to work on that task. So if I pulled a, 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 a particular task for somebody who, I didn't, who didn't have access to it, it's not going to allow me to assign them uh, just based on those qualifications. So that's a big, a big way that you can start onboarding. I can also assign directly from the top, so I can take somebody uh, and, and directly, uh, directly assign them to a particular task as well. 
If you have also service level agreements, what I can do is also reveal those service level agreements so I can start seeing where we might be at risk to be able to, uh, to resort and reprioritize to make sure that these particular tasks get taken care of. So that's a little bit about what we've done so far, showing you, uh, showing you some, of the, uh, some of the capabilities from the new hire side, from her manager, and also the tasks themselves and how they can be monitored uh, and, and, uh, and load balanced. So the last thing I wanted to talk to you about is after we've uh, gone through a little bit about uh, the case, the cases themselves, is how we can also take a look at strategic decision making and making sure that those analytics of the processes themselves are available. And these are just some examples of dashboards of some of the metrics that we can capture. So, so just to sort of get your get your attention on on things like being able to track. Uh, the employee experience index. Uh, how is overall feedback going uh, on, on the overall experience? Um, how are, are there any kind of bottlenecks? And making sure that you have available uh, very easy to understand tr uh, charts and graphs to give you alerts when, it, when you want to start focusing on things like bottlenecks or other types of issues. Moments that matter in different types of satisfaction rank rankings. We can continue to survey those users during each one of these micro moments to see how things are going, to see how, uh, how the process is as well. And then being able to provide uh, net promoter scores, as you can see at the very top. So I can um, also start seeing what those target amounts are. Are those at risk for any, any reason as well? Another, another example on an analytic is being able to use engaging different eye-catching ways so that you can start uh, focusing on different areas, like the word cloud you're seeing on the right-hand side. And this is just really representing that the word request came in more often uh, in the new cases that were coming in. So this might indicate training that's needed or other types of strategic, uh, strategic moves. So just trying, trying to give you an idea of how the types of ratings and trends and how we can take that information and, and organize that in a way that's the most helpful for your strategic decision makers. So in this journey, we're able to see how that new hire could be informed about the tasks they need to, to complete as well as allowing their manager to make sure those tasks are, are being completed on time and to see if there are any issues with any of those uh, micro moments in the onboarding journey, as well as being able to take a look at the cases themselves, how they're organized, how they're coming in, being able to load balance those cases that are coming in uh, from onboarding and for other types of tasks and also to be able to take a look at the processes, them, uh, processes uh, themselves to uh, make strategic decisions as well. So that was a little bit about the software itself. And at this point, I'd like to turn it back over to Alex or Sheila and see if there's any questions that we can address. Thanks, Lisa. This is Alex. Um, George, do we have any questions on the line before we... Uh... Before we conclude, uh, yes, we do. We have a few questions that have come in. Uh, the first one is: um, Are you able to bring in applicant tracking new hire data into your platform? And this is Lisa, and I can take that. And we are so as a platform, we can integrate with with uh, with other systems to bring that data in to do things like being able to see time to hire. Also, to be able to make sure that that data is seamless, so the uh, the data is accurate as it's coming in directly from an applicant tracking system, instead of having to type it in separately. But absolutely, we can bring that in as part of the onboarding process. Okay, excellent. And I think the uh, next question is probably for Alex. Uh, thoughts on innovation at the edge, where it is dri driven by necessity rather than deliberately. Does our troops find ways to use the capabilities provided in ways not imagined by developers or engineers? Furthermore, the tactical edge can adapt and present unexpected challenges to adversaries. How do we design capabilities to facilitate innovation? That is a great question. You know, it, it, it largely comes down to innovation, in my experience, is 
often not a, a, a and digital transformation isn't the digital problem it's a it's a cultural problem and so i think what this question is alluding to is it's a it's a cultural shift in mindset and it's you know from a military standpoint marine corps officer standpoint it's that special trust and confidence being given uh the flexibility to adapt and it's a mutually beneficial relationship so a lot of times, I mean, you, you get your, your highest demand signal for innovation is often at the leading edge, is at the pointy end of the spear. Um, it's where a lot of authorities and resources don't often exist, but it's also the greatest place for program offices to get free R&D. Um, working at McTissa on, and, and Marine Corps Systems Command, having the, uh, the support center out there that was our biggest challenge was was shortening the informational chain from user how they were using it why they were why they weren't um, what changes they were making and and allowing that flexibility while also providing that information back to the program offices so they can say so they can see that hey this is how um, your users are actually implementing the system and and here's the ways they're innovating so that the decision makers can actually implement those changes in a controlled manner. So you 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 have a you have a engine, a catalyst for ideas and change at the point end of the sphere where they need it, but you get that visibility, and that's where ServiceNow, the platform as a whole, comes into play because all of that can ca be captured seamlessly on one integrated platform, from demand all the way to um, all the way to adoption, and it's and that's the cultural challenge of it previously has been that nobody at the program office level has the visibility into what's being done at the tactical edge. And so if you leverage a single platform, you're now creating that visibility with also the flexibility for modernization and change. Um, and so in the context of like the, and it's the same way with the HR service delivery and, and allowing people the flexibility to do things in their own unique way, but tying it into the bigger picture of the of the talent management problem at a whole, this is where we have the most data and we underutilize it because it's in these siloed systems. So when you start to push everything down and allow, give a common structure, but allow the flexibility throughout, um, you gain the visibility, but you also keep things creative and keep things flowing. Okay, excellent. Uh, next question. Can some of the onboarding tasks launch automatically without user intervention? And this is Lisa. Yes, it absolutely can. So you might have certain onboarding tasks that trigger other onboarding tasks to launch automatically. Uh, that uh, things like notifications or emails um, or even enrollment uh, into certain uh, types of systems that could be part of the overall process. And if I wasn't, if I didn't emphasize this earlier, uh, the onboarding tasks can also be uh, specific to the type of job or role that the user is going to have. So one set of onboarding tasks might be different as uh, different uh, across your organization. Okay, super. And for Sheila, how does the software interact with and leverage an individual's PKI slash PIV certificates to automate processes? I am looking into that question, Matthew. I, I saw your question. I'm not sure how to answer that. Um, could I get back to you? Uh, yeah. Any any questions that we can't uh, answer right now, we can. Uh, you guys can can uh, reach out to the questioner uh, directly uh, offline. So so uh, you'll you'll be able to do that. Yes. Okay. And um, can you have different onboarding tasks for different departments or job types? Yes, you can. So that could be configured according to the policies of each department. Okay, very good. Do you provide offboarding tasks or crossboarding tasks? Yes, the same tool that is tracking the different tasks that are involved for the onboarding event could be configured 
for somebody who is leaving the organization. So they might have a series of tasks that need to be monitored, that have workflows going through different departments, things like collecting uh, the equipment that, that was, that was uh, given to them during the onboarding process, um, uh, changing their payroll status, things along those lines, all of these feeding back into the, uh, the personnel and other related systems. Uh, cross-boarding or uh, maybe somebody transferring from one role to another that also includes uh, different types of enrollment or different types of equipment or other tasks uh, could also be managed using our same tool set. Okay, good. And I'll also add in there, you know, the deployments and uh, TADs and everything else is is really I remember, you know, getting pre prepped up for deployments, and that's a that's a life event, and it involves not just the military, the organization, it involves the individuals, it involves the families, and so that is across the organization, different departments that all need to be a part of that process, and it's a light it's a life cycle event um, mm -hmm. that's important to manage. So. No, that's a good point because usually we think about life events really, really uh, touching benefits enrollment, and it does. But it also could it could also Im impact things like change of address um, or other types of, of family related uh, enrollment. Okay, good. Thank you both. And can you automate the build out and signing of PDFs? Uh, and that's a yes. Uh, we can also uh, track a digital signature or a hand-drawn signature uh, on documents in general. Okay, interesting. And I believe this is our last question. Can you create documents from table data? Yes, um, not only documents, but if you wanted to automate that into an online form uh, that could be uh, viewed and maintained online, that also could be could be part of our our, our platform, uh, and that also could be saved to a PDF format and printed. Okay, excellent. Um, so thank you, Alex, Sheila, and Lisa, and thank you to our viewers for submitting questions. If you did submit a question that uh, didn't quite make it into the inbox yet uh, or, or that our experts were not able to answer, uh, as we mentioned, they will try to follow up with you directly offline. Uh, please note that there are some resources available to you under the Resources tab. And I'd like to also point out that you can continue to link to the archived version of this webinar and see previous Signal webinars on ASEA's Signal Magazine website. So that concludes our Signal Magazine webinar for today. Again, we thank all of you for being with us. Have a great day, everybody.